Good morning. My name is Chris Adlam with Youth Pledge for Employers, and I'm delighted to be joined by Bobby Harrison from Hustle Fitness. Hello, Bobby. How are we doing? You good? Yeah, not too bad. Yourself? Yeah, good. Thank you. Fantastic. I guess my, you know, sort of start of attend has to be, you know, please can you tell us about sort of what you do and what Hustle Fitness does? So Hustle Box, we're called Hustle Boxing Fitness. So we are a, yeah, sorry. <laughs> we're a non-contact boxing gym based in Norwich. We have a venue in Norwich and in Wyndham now. We just opened up in Wyndham four weeks ago. We are a gym that um, bases, our, bases our classes and our memberships around mental health and wellness. So we have a range of different classes from, from boxing to strength classes. We have personal training. We have classes for kids, classes for female only, classes for over 60s. We have a big, yes, we have a big range of classes. It's um, it's not a commercial gym, we're an independent gym, so we're not like a pure gym or anything like that. We're um, a bit more community based, so we try to make it um, where everyone kind of knows each other, everyone looks out for each other. It's not a kind of place where you come with your headphones in and don't chat to anybody. It's mm. a bit more, um, a bit more personalised, so yeah. No, brilliant. And you sort of touched on it already there, like the thing I was going to ask you about. And sorry that I sort of I say, forgot the boxing aspect when I was describing. As, oh. as, 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 as I say, anyone viewing this um, video, yeah, they might be familiar with, as you say, a pure gym or, you know, the gym or, you know, a sort of a mainstream gym. And as I say, you've touched on it a bit already there, but sort of, yeah, what are the difference really sort of for you in working in, you know, in your gym? And then, as I say, then if you were to go to, as I say, yeah, a more sort of bigger brand gym. I think personally, we, myself and our coaches, my coaches have a bit more freedom to be who they want to be. I think in a commercial gym, you're kind of led down a specific route. You, you have lots of constraints about what you can and can't do. Whereas we are a bit more open to ideas. And if my coach has an idea and brings it to me, I'm more than happy to run it and see what happens. Whereas I think commercial gyms, you're kind of, it's just like a commercial job, I guess you're kind of told what to do, when to do, how to do it, and you have to wear a uniform. And we try to make it a bit more, a bit more natural, a bit more, you know, a bit more, a bit of a nicer place. Not a nicer place to work because obviously anywhere is nice to work, but we try to be a bit more relaxed. And yeah, like our co our coaches are very, um, they've got lots of ideas. And I think if you're in a certain commercial gym, you're probably not allowed to do certain things unless it's unless you've been told you can do it. No, brilliant. And thanks for sort of clearing that up. And it's really nice to sort of actually know that, as you say, your your coaches can, you know, make sure they get their personality across. You know, they're not being yeah. um, moulded to a specific corporate image. Um, mm -hmm. As you say, you know, they've got the freedom to, you know, as they come come to you with their new ideas, try things out and be themselves, which yeah. um, must make for an overall more positive workplace, to be honest. Oh, 100 percent. Everyone here is really, everyone here gets on really well. Everyone's really happy. We all we all work together on ideas. We we train together, and there's no kind of also with the with the commercial gyms. If they're personal trainers, they're all kind of in competition with each other. They're all trying to hunt for different for different person. They're all trying to hunt for like their personal training sessions with the clients. Whereas our place, no one really nobody really has to kind of fight for a personal trainer. The personal trainers the people come to them. If they if the coach is teaching a class. And they get on well with someone that's more than likely that person's going to speak to them and kind of say right do you want to do some personal training together and work on this this aspect of your training and yeah there's there's no kind of you get a, i've been in the industry a while now and there's, there's a lot between personal trainers there's a lot of kind of backfighting and trying to get each other's clients see each other's clients whereas none of that really happens here because naturally the the members will come to the to the pt so they've all they've all got their own personal training and stuff yeah no. No, brilliant. Uh, thank you. And you sort of touched a bit on it there and it sort of goes to my next question, which is like, I guess when anyone's sort of looking to get into maybe coaching or personal training sort of thinks about maybe some of the qualities or traits they need to get into it, you know, it's probably easy to sort of like, especially with social media nowadays to think, okay, if I want to be a personal trainer, I literally have to have be the loudest person in the room. Yeah. I need to be an absolute 10 out of 10 in the way I look and the way I feel and everything at all times, if you see what I mean. You know, yeah. sort of, I say you from being in the industry for a, a little while more, you know, what traits does it actually take to be a sort of good coach or PT? I think you have to be able to relate to people and understand their needs and like not everyone, for me, it's more about how you feel inside than how you look. Mm. I've said to people, like, anyone can get a six-pack if they want to. If they really want to, anyone can get a six-pack. 
that doesn't mean you're then going to be happy inside your head. Mm. If you're if you're not happy with what's going on up in here, but your body looks amazing, it doesn't make a difference. You're still going to be unhappy. So we we the way we work is we we someone comes to us and says right why what in your personal training session what are your goals and they might say oh, I want to lose some weight that the but then that that's fine but then but why do you want to lose the weight what's the real real reason you want to lose the weight or they might say I want to tone up so why do you want to tone up like what's the real reason you want to do this and if, if you if you can find out those connection points with somebody as as in why they really want to do it rather than just oh, I just want to lose some weight. Because most people will just say that because that's that's what they think they have to say, but there might be a deeper me- there might be a deeper reason to it. They might be unhappy in their job. They might they might not like like how they look naked. They might not have a high libido anymore. They might not just have the energy they used to have. So it's finding out the real reasons why they're unhappy first. Then you can work with them a lot more. You actually know the real reason what, deep down. Then you can connect with them rather than just being oh we're just going to do a thousand squats and you're going to lose some weight. Because mm. after a while, that's just going to, they'll go back to square one and it's not really going to move forward. So would you say that probably, you know, for someone interested in, let's say, in coaching personal training, that rapport building ability, that ability to, as you say, talk to people and understand people and sort of, yeah. you know, I say, understand where they're coming from is probably the, the most important trait? I'd 100% that's the most important trait, definitely. Yeah, speaking to people, understanding their needs, listening making recommendations, but yeah, 100% having that rapport with somebody and understanding people's needs and what they want, definitely, 100%. That's, that's the main thing you need. No, fantastic, thank you. And as I say, it's, it's really sort of interesting to hear that, as you say, from, from yourself, who's sort of, you know, sort of been in the industry a while, you know, as I say, you've probably seen your fair share of coaches and personal trainers and stuff, and as I say, to sort of hear what it actually requires to be, you know, a good p- yeah. coach or personal trainer, as I say, compared to sort of all the ones we see on Instagram or all over social media, you know, because as I say, I think we all sort of realise that, okay, that's not actually how it is. But if yeah. you see what I mean, unless unless you are in the industry, you probably don't know how it actually is. Yeah, a lot of personal trainers will, you'll see people like absolutely beasting people till they can't walk or they're sick. And they think that's an achievement. In reality, that person's just been sick, they can't walk, the next day they can't train. So you've just taken that person who, for example, hasn't done a lot of training, they've then been sick, they then can't walk the next day, that means they can't train the next day. So that's not really achieving anything because the way we the way we work, we say train, train smart, not harder. Mm-hmm. So if you if you're if you've got someone brand new and you're really, really pushing them out of their comfort zone and they can't do what you asked them to do. They're not going to want to come back again because they're going to hurt the next day. You still you've got you've got to take things slowly with people if they've not done it before. If someone's like an athlete, then yeah, you can push them harder. But it's not just about pushing people to as hard as they can work for that hour or thirty minutes. It's understanding what they need. Like they can't do a certain move. Let's work on that first because you could work somebody like like I said till they're sick, and then. They can't train again the next day. Whereas if someone if someone trains the seventy percent every time they train, they can train the next day. They can train the next day after that, after that, after that. You can still do something the next day. But if, say, for example, you, you've done a leg day and you can't walk the next day up the stairs, how is that beneficial for them? They can't then walk. They can't move, and it's like they're not going to want to come back. So you've got you've got to think about how you're training people, why you're training them in certain ways, and it's not it's not just about how many calories they burn, how much they sweat. I think a lot of people see that, think too much into that as like, oh, that's, that's a great workout because I burned a thousand calories, I really sweated, but then you can't walk the next day. So who's who's really benefited there? Nobody. Yeah. No, I completely understand where you're coming from, and it's and it's really like interesting to know, I say, how much of a sort of, I say, personal and empathetic value you know you put on you know the skills that the coaches need, and it sort of actually leads me to sort of think about and ask this question actually, which is sort of any young person who thinks they maybe want to as say get into sort of coaching fitness personal training, they will probably think, okay, um I need to be doing any kind of fitness stuff I can in my spare time to obviously build that up on my CV or have that experience. But as I say, now you've sort of, as I say, spoken so much about the personal element and you know that sort of sincereness you need to have to yourself. What you know, if you were going to hire a coach tomorrow, you know, what kind of things do you see sort of on their CV or, you know, do you talk to them about, you know, once you get past sort of their physical experience to yeah. make you think actually, you know, you're going to be really good at building rapport with people? Yeah. I think stuff like if they've got customer service experience, I think that's one thing for me. I've 
I've done every job you can ever imagine. I've done sales jobs, I've done marketing jobs, I've done customer service jobs. So for me, if you've got all different kinds of experiences, if, you, if you've worked in a shop, front front facing shop with people before, for me that's customer service. You can talk to people. So it's having those it's having those extra life skills that are going to relate to coaching. But also then it's for me the way I hire coaches now is. I, I look for kind of people who've got their own niche in their in their kind of because fit, fitness is like so broad. So my, my niche is boxing. So I'm a boxing coach. So if someone comes to me and they're a strength conditioning coach, for me that's a niche. If you're just a general PT, you're just a general PT. There's yeah. there's thousands of general PTs in the UK now. If you if you are thinking about becoming a personal trainer, I would say one of the most important things is get your get your PT qualifications, but then focus on one area of that that you can specialize in. Because if you're in a gym with 10 personal trainers and all they do is the same thing, but you're the boxing coach, who's going to get more clients? Probably the boxing coach. Because yeah. he's got more of a unique skill than everybody else. So get your qualifications, but then look at, right, what unique skill can I get? Could I become a calisthenics coach? Could I become a, a strength and conditioning coach? Could I become a, a football coach, but also a PT? Again, that's another one which is very popular at the moment, football PTs. So the kids who are playing football regularly, they want a bit of extra extra personal training to work on a certain aspect. If you've got that personal training qualification and you're a football expert as well, you're going to again stand out in the crowd. I think having that niche where you can stand out is always going to work better than just being a one trick pony, I think. No, brilliant. Thank you. That's, as I say, that's a really sort of useful insight. As I say, you know, I, I wouldn't have even have sort of thought about the you know, I say that the market of PTs being sort of, you know, as you say, sort of not polluted, but, you know, full of people, as I say, who haven't got that, as I say, that unique selling point or that, you know, something that separates them apart from everyone else. So it's actually really, you know, useful advice to know, actually, as you say, once you've got your relevant qualifications, find an area, you know, or a niche and and target that, because as, as you say, it's only going to sort of help separate you from the market and help, and help you long term. Um, and one thing you sort of touched on a bit earlier is you sort of touched on some of the things that your coaches do and stuff. And I sort of asked this question to all employees, and I know there is no such thing as a typical day. I'll write that right now. I know there's such a thing. But if you were to sort of talk me through the kind of thing that you sort of managing both sites do on a daily basis, and maybe sort of a typical day for some of your coaches, you know, what would they, you know, what things are they doing in a day? What does it involve? I think for a coach who is a personal trainer, you You'd be probably starting quite early, I would have thought. Most yeah. most would probably start at six o'clock in the morning. They'd have they'd have their their training sessions. They might have some coaches could do up to eight hours a day of, of coaching back to back sometimes. But for me, that's that's too much. I think you need to have kind of set limits to because you, if you train eight people in a day back to back, by the time that eight point comes around, they're not going to get the best service. Mm. So I think it's, they spend a lot of their time training people. I think they spend time programming what they're going to train, what they're going to do in the session. They'll spend a lot of time marketing because being a personal trainer, you've got to market yourself, you're self-employed, you've, you've got to try and get new clients. They're, they're creating content on their social media to try and get more clients. They're, they're talking to the camera, they're coming up with ideas. Yeah, I think it's, it's a very varied day as a personal trainer. You, you could be, you could be in, in one place in the morning and somewhere else in the next. So. A busy day. You've touched a little bit on it there, and this was sort of the next question I was going to ask. Is like, you know, what are the other, what are the good days? What are the positives? You know, and you know the real highlights of being, as say, sort of a, a coach and PT. And what are the challenges? What are the bad days like? Um, I think the good days are when you see someone improving. Someone, you get a lot of nice messages from people saying how you affected their lives and. That's that's when you know like you're doing something right, and you see, you see people get results and they're happy and they want to come back. I think the low days you get to times like now December, where things can drop off a lot. People cancel on you last minute, and that can be quite frustrating. If you've got a client booked in and they cancel on you, then you can't get someone else in booked in. And it's as a as a self-employed trainer, it's it's a tough time of year, November and December, because people aren't focusing on their health there. They're thinking about Christmas. They've got they've got bills to pay. They've got um, presents to buy. So, as a personal trainer, you kind of go off the you're the kind of last on their list, really. So, you've got to kind of know that you've got like money in place for that time of year when it's difficult, and you've got to think about 
you've got to plan your year out correctly really but is it, is it being self-employed is is tough but it's for me it's more rewarding than a nine to five personally no that's brilliant and actually it's, it's being the self-employed part i was going to talk about next which is as you sort of touched on earlier, some of the skills like you need to sort of mention about, you know, sort of um, branding and marketing online. Obviously, you know, at the end of the day, you're effectively an entrepreneur, if you see what yeah. I mean. So what I was going to say is like when you first came to sort of, you know, um, seeing sort of being some point that kind of things, obviously, you know, you said you've done a lot, a lot of jobs and stuff. But I'm assuming maybe you had to learn a bit about marketing. You had to learn about branding. You had to learn about people on social media. You had to, you know, learn about PR and these kind of things, you know, sort of. What kind of things did you do to help you understand that? And, you know, and again, what were the sort of challenges you faced? What were the things you thought, oh, hang on a minute, OK, didn't expect I'd have to learn how to do that or something like that? Um, I worked a nine to five job for a long time. And as I got on with that, I kind of started having these little side hustles, which is basically where hustle came from, me having side hustles on top of my normal job. OK. Where I found things outside of my normal job, which I really enjoyed. So I started doing social media marketing. I started doing um, advertising on social media and I got these little things. I, just, I basically learned it all on YouTube. Okay, I pretty much learned a lot, of, a lot of my stuff on YouTube because there's, there's so many, there's so much advice out there. There's also resources out there available to people where you can, you can do a marketing course for quite cheap, right, online. And yeah, I think I kind of learned as I, as I went. So I was learning on the job. It's not something I just learned overnight. I'd, I'd kind of, I'd been around sales teams. I'd been around marketing and it's all stuff you have to learn as you go. And it's, you're learning as you go and you make mistakes, you get things right, you get things wrong and you're right. No, since I opened up this second gym, I kind of, I knew what to do this time rather than the first time I opened the gym, I was like, well, I'm just trying here, see what happens. And now I know the formula that works, right? This is what I need to do before the gym opens. These promotions I need to run, this is the marketing I need to do. So I think it's like kind of testing things out, seeing what works, what doesn't. Yeah. No, it's brilliant. I've spoken to a lot of sort of, you know, um, sole traders and entrepreneurs and, you know, people are say have gone into things for themselves and you wouldn't believe the amount of people have just said, yeah, I Googled it. Yeah, I YouTubed it. Yeah, you know, I looked online for what resources I could. And I think sort of and it's probably reflective of the attitude you need to be a coach or PD. I guess you need to have a a can do attitude yeah. or willingness to try yeah. um about it because as you say otherwise you're not going to sort of make those mistakes, learn those lessons. Yeah. Um you know as you say sort of with your opening your second gym that make will make things easier for you long term. Yeah you've got to, you've got a very thick skin especially when you first start because the hardest thing is going to be when you first start is to get new clients. So there's going to be there's going to be times where you don't have any clients and it's going to be a real struggle like why am I doing this? But once you get one client and you and you do really well with them, they're going to tell their friend. You might get a new client, they're going to tell their friend. So it's all about refer. It's all about speaking to people, referrals, and if you treat people well, people people will like you and you're likable. They'll tell their friends about you. And like I said, if you've got your niche, like my niche, when I when I moved back to Norwich three years ago. I was in the gym teaching boxing. No one else was teaching boxing. Within a month, I had 10 clients. Brilliant. Everyone saw me doing it in the corner of the gym, padding people, and they were like, oh, should you box in? I'm like, yeah. Can you teach me? I'm like, yeah, no worries. So it's something, if you can, if you can deliver something that's not being delivered already, something brand new, something that's interesting, I think you'll always stand out from the crowd. So it's, ha it's having that, like I said, it's having that niche, making sure you can stand out from other people and having your speciality and not just being the same as everybody else. That's boring. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely agree. And I, I think that's a great piece of advice. And when it comes to sort of advice, and this is all my final question really to end on, and I've asked this to all the employers I've spoken to, and you've touched on, you know, a little bit about the sort of the journey you've gone through, and as you say, sort of working nine to five and other jobs and stuff, you know, to how you got here. But if you could sort of go back now um, and have a word, say, with 17, 18 year old Bobby, you know, um, taking into account now all the experiences you've got, the jobs you've had, the things you've learned, what what would be the one piece of career advice you would give to your younger self? Great question. Um, <laughs> it's hard because like I'm 41 and I didn't get into this industry until six years ago. So 
for me it was it's just a case of trying as many things as you can like don't don't stick don't stay to the same job i stayed in the same job for nearly nine years and i kind of i could have done so much more with my time and i could have started earlier i could have um yeah i would say if you've got a job and you start feeling like right i can do something else now so if you're especially if you're young every two years think about something doing something else like learn a new skill every two years and then by the time 10 years goes past you can do marketing you can do sales you can do customer service then you can run your own business you've got all the skills you need to run your own business and if you run your own business you're probably gonna be more happy than work with somebody else i'd say if that's what you if that's what you want to do long term you want to have your own gym you want to be a personal trainer you need a lot of a lot of life skills to be able to do this so yeah for me it would have been i would have started earlier to be honest